I don't know, somebody was talking about for the first time ever, Rick. Uh, not Rick Rubin, but uh, Russell Simmons was telling people this is why Rick Rubin left. You know, he doing some interviews, like, this is why Rick left. I never had any beef with anybody. I don't beef with nobody. I don't have no beef with nobody. <laughs> so I'm like, what? Like, they, he, he basically tapped the situation and didn't touch it the right way. So I guess he just left an avenue for me to come in and tell everybody what was the shakeup at Def Jam. Because he didn't explain it right. Now, back when they formed Def Jam Records, Rick was mostly a guy that was in the sound. And so was, at this time, Russell was too. He was in the hip hop sound, like all those guys was already out. Like Cool Herc and all them. You know, Curtis Blow and all that. He wanted to create a label, a home for these artists to, to have, to come to. Like, when we create this label that, that we got right here, this is monumental. Like, they would be with us. But before they could do that, while they was trying to build this little label, Run DMC well, had got a record deal from a major. I think they were with uh, RCA or Profile Records or one of them. And they got a deal. So when they had a record deal with, with uh, Run DMC and they started making some money with them, they were, con you know, went in as management. Russell Simmons, he wanted Run DMC to sign with him through Def Jam, then go to the majors, but it didn't work out that way. You know, they saw the big money with the majors and wanted to go, so they was like, all right, we'll do that route. So Russ ended up coming out with his own management company, too, called Rush Management. So Run DMC wasn't signed to Def Jam at all. They were just managed by Russell. So managed, you know, whatever they produced the records, it was just like they were signed on Def Jam, but they weren't. So, anyway, Def Jam needs artists. Somebody to launch the label, really, to be that face. And while they were going through this process of Run DMC and doing this, LL Cool J came in and blew everybody away. So when they did I Need a Beat, that was the first Def Jam record. But at the same time, Ad Rock and Beastie Boys was already there because Rick Rubin knew Ad Rock. So when the Beasties came aboard, the sound back then is what attracted Rick and made Rick believe. Because rap music back then was basically off the rock records. A lot of that was the rock. Ba, 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 ba. That's why Run DMC the King of Rock. Rick Rubin loved rock and roll. He loved rock. He was definitely into hardcore rock. So him and and Russ got a long good because Russ is like, yeah, I need that, but I need drums. I need some drums, hard rock with with a drum, with a with a drum rhythm. You know that you can't beat that. You know, Rick like drum. I mean, Russ like drums. So you got rock <laughs> music with drums. That's Run DMC, right there. They born. But Beastie Boys, they have off their own style of doing it. It's rock, but then they got stuff that just got the drums too, without the rock in it. You know, they, they was a combination of having their own style flow, you know, they whole creativeness to it. They didn't want to be Run DMC. They didn't want to do a song with Run DMC on it, so that they'd be like, okay, this is the white version of Run DMC. Even though they tried to like promote it, like Run DMC, Beastie Boys, the tour was, you know, was outstanding. But the difference was when they start having some friction was when they started blowing up. License to ill sells all these records. Um, 
Then moving on to LL Cool J's Bad Album. The Bad Album is just explosive. The Beastie Boys is due, their contract is up. After License the Ill, it's time to re up with the Beastie Boys. And, you know, Pam. And it was a big melee about, you know, paying the Beastie Boys. They went on and put the money forward to his public enemy. And Rick Rubin never liked it that. He never liked it the fact that the Public Enemy album, the first album, the Don't Rush the Show album, um, how it went, and all the intake they took from, you know, working with everybody. And that's why the second album, Public Enemy, was like, we're going to do it our way, that's it. Leave, you know, let us do the album our way. We did it y'all way the first time. It didn't really come off right. Let us do it this way, our way now. So if we fail, it's on us. But we know we did the album the right way. Russell believed in it. And was like, this is the movement we need to go into right now. And you had... Rick, who wasn't really happy with what had happened with the Beastie Boys, because the Beastie Boys was like, Russell's a racist. Because <laughs> he told Rick Rubin, like, they're a bunch of white boys. <laughs> well, I'm going to pay white boys all that money for it. Four Jewish white boys, I'm going to pay them all that money. We got poor brothers in the ghetto that can rap. Uh, I'd rather get the money to the poor, poor ghetto kids out there that can rap. These boys got money. They rich already. Their parents got money. So he, they, he was like, man, Rick Rubin, like Rick Rubin went and told the Beastie Boys that. And then the Beastie Boys was like, oh man, he racist. So they wanted off the label and everything. They didn't want nothing to do with Russell and Rick was a part of it. They didn't want Rick, like, look Rick, you were part of this, you with him, we, we gone, we can't be here no more. So they was like, look, they don't want to pay us what we're supposed to get. And we feel we should get this much. We sold this many records. We should have this some kind of money in advance for our next album. And Russell didn't believe it. So, so they were released after he held them for about almost a year before he let, released them. And I think they got their release in 1988. But he held on to them for a minute before he just like let them go. So Rick is still bitter about that. But at the same time, Rick had problems going on with his rock group he wanted to sign to the label called Slayer. Slayer. I got one of their CDs in the back. Slayer had a song on that Reign of Terror, I think it was, or Reign of Blood. And the song they had on there was so vile that... Um, Columbia Records wanted to take it off because they talked about how the Nazis was killing the Jews and they were like, this is just a mess. You know, like, we can't have this. And the Nazi doctor, the concentration camps and all that stuff. See, today's time, it would have been monumental to have that, but they blocked the whole record for coming out. Columbia Records would not put that out in Def Jam. They told Def Jam, no way will you put this record out. So, with that being said, <laughs> Slayer was, like, Rick was like, I mean, Russ was like, look, man, Slayer, I don't mean coming out. And he was, Rick was just had enough with Columbia and everything else, so Rick wanted out. Mostly, you know, wasn't mostly with Russell. It was mostly because of Columbia and the fact that he was like, man, we don't run the label no more. Columbia Records is running Def Jam. Look, we need to leave, Russ. We need to leave. Pull the record. We'll pull the label. We'll start another one. And Russell Simmons looked at Rick Rubin like he was an idiot. <laughs> you want to leave? Are you crazy? And he was like, no way. So he stayed working with, he was like, Public Enemy album dropped, and it went the way it did. Russ was like, I can run this myself. <laughs> I can run all this. You want out? Fine. Let me buy you out. So Columbia Records and everybody else, they bought Rick out. 
Rick was ready when he started his own label, like, Deaf American Records. Where it's gonna be more just for the artists, the music, you know, he was delusional. And that's when he was like, he doesn't get it. He's still gonna have to work with a distributor. So whoever's gonna distribute your music, what major company's gonna pick up your label, or you're gonna be independent, you gotta pay for everything out of pocket. So you're gonna be back in the same boat. But he just did not want to deal with Columbia Records. So that was the major riff of what happened between the two. Rick wanted to buy out after the situation happened with with uh, Beastie Boys and definitely with Slayer. But another reason he wanted out is because he, you know, he saw the way things were turning. Everybody was getting away from rock rap. Rock rap was taking a, a seat and everybody was going mostly with the James Brown samples. You know, it was more going in the sampling than actual samples of rock. You know, the rock, the drums, you know, Less Than Zero was the last thing Rick Rubin did. They He got a buddy buddy with a producer and they put him on the, um, you know, let him run the whole soundtrack for the movie Less Than Zero. And that was Rick's big project. That's why he did, he produced the record uh, Going Back to Cali. And Rick was good for one thing. He knew how to make a mainstream hit. You may not like the song, but if he said, look, I need you to do this song, and this the beat, it's going to be a crossover success. Going Back to Cali was a crossover success for LL Cool J. And a lot of people didn't like it when they first heard it. Then, next thing you know, Going Back to Cali was like requested. It was played at nightclubs in L.A., in New York, they still play it. It became a crossover hit between black and white. Going back to Cali. I said, going back to Cali? Cali was the hit because it had the bass. <laughs> if you had sounds, going back to Cali was it. But Rick Rubin, that was his main contribution and he he worked with that guy again when he got his label, Deaf American Records, and he just started going off the deep end, making records off LSD, and he was just gone. <laughs> he was making sounds that didn't even make sense. I was like, this is nuts. He had went far off rap. He was somewhere in the Tibet mountains with his <laughs> mental. He was gone. I need Play it now. You're like, what is this? You listen to it. It's Rick Root. Links into it. So that's what really happened between the two. It was mostly Columbia Records more than it was him and Russ. And Russ really wanted to go in another direction with the sound and with the artists more than just staying with the rock and doing all this stuff. Because in the midst of it, in the midst of all this going on, they forgot about Run DMC. And Run DMC is just sitting there like, nobody's thinking about us. Let's do drugs. Let's party. You know, they getting, they just celebrating off Tougher Than Leather and touring off the album and just screwing stuff up. And they have no direction. So Russell, continuously thinking he can run the company, convinces Run DMC to change their look. And when they came out with Pauls, with, with actually Jay rapping, I'm Jay. I make up the tray. Now check out the dance that I display. It's called the Pauls. The new dance on the dance floor. First you move. And then you stop. I'm like, I was like, oh my God. That's Brian DMC. <laughs> like the beat and everything, it just wasn't Run DMC. If that was Bell Bill DeVoe, I'm like, yeah, this would be cool for them. This is not cool for Run DMC. <laughs> 
And Jay is not a rapper. What is Jay doing on the mic? Rapping. This just did not make sense. This was not Run DMC. That album, I bought the record. The cover told me I was in trouble. And I said, no, it can't be this bad. And I listened to these songs. They were so, even running at the end of one of the songs was like, a party time. And he's like, this is some bull. <laughs> like at the end of the record. So if the artist is telling you this is some bull, <laughs> it's party time. We're here for the party. Get up and move your body. Cause it's party time. Oh, God. I have heard Cat Screw with more harmony than that record. <laughs> it was terrible. Oh, man. Right at the end, it was like, this is so bull. <laughs> I might go find that on YouTube. Play it. Just go to the end and hear Rudd just say, this is so bull. <laughs> Needless to say, that record didn't work, but I'm out.